Divine Truth. The name of this presentation is Pseudo Spirituality, and it is part of the Human Soul series. It was presented in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia, on the 9th of June 2012. This is part two. Okay, welcome back. Have a nice lunch. Awesome. It's quite sunny outside now, isn't it? A bit warmer than this morning. Yeah. All right, well, let's right. proceed with our discussion about pseudo-spirituality. Have we got all the recording is all happening? Awesome. Yep. And just invite you guys again, if you want to ask questions while we're talking, please go ahead. Yeah. Yep. I'll try and keep a lookout for you. And look out. Look yep. out. Yeah. All right. So there was two basic topics we wanted to talk about now after the break. And the first one was how pseudo-spirituality promotes spirit influence and overcloaking. Mm. So what can you tell us about that or would you like me to? Well, if we look at it as a general introduction first, um, the problem with pseudo-spirituality is because there are so many addictions involved with pseudo-spirituality, as a result of that, there are a lot of spirits involved with pseudo-spirituality as well. So spirits utilise the addictions of men, men, men and women in order to continue to have their own emotions met while they're uh, on earth or around the earth in the earth state. And so we have a lot of what are called earthbound spirits, which you've probably heard the terms of, uh, term of. And these earthbound spirits um, often influence people around the earth to practice certain things from a religious perspective or in the guise of a religion in order for the people in the spirit world who have yet to resolve their unhealed emotional issues and their issues of being unloving, they finish up embracing the people on earth and overcloaking them or influencing them into a certain set of beliefs or practices. And perhaps what we need to do is illustrate that by going through them one by one and just illustrating to you how that happens. Yeah. So obviously um, pseudo-spirituality promotes our facade and fake involvement mm -hmm. and requires little knowledge of our real self. Yes. So one of the first problems uh, that we face is because pseudo-spirituality, um, and it doesn't start with an S, pseudo. <laughs> I mean, is sort of like promotes facade. Because of that, and if it, 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 each person who lives in pseudo-spirituality, some kind of pseudo-spirituality, and remember we can do that even if we're listening to truth, we can still live in that place. Every time we are in a facade, we're in a facade because we want certain addictions met. And spirits use addictions to control us. <coughs> now, since we're in the state where we want addictions met, that then attracts spirits who also want similar addictions met. Hmm. And as a result of that, those spirits usually finish up either overcloaking or influencing the person on earth into supporting the addiction, whatever the addiction is. So rather than confronting the addiction, they support the addiction. And as a, pro, uh, uh, as a result of that, we're not seeing our real self. And, and unfortunately, we're have attracted now spirits who don't want us to ever be our real self. They want us to be what they want so that they get their addictions met through us. So this is very, very similar to a person who's addicted to alcohol, for example. If you have an addiction to alcohol, there will be spirits who will come in, come in and influence that condition to be addicted to alcohol. And as a result, those spirits can then get some of the alcohol needs that they have met through the relationship with you. And pseudo-spirituality promotes this in a lot of ways. So... Let's look at some of the addictions that I might, might refer to. We see it happening a lot with sexual addictions. So there are whole forms of spirituality revolving around sexual addictions and having sexual addictions met. 
These involve things like, and, and when I say addictions, there's addictions in two sides. There's the addiction to having lots of sex with lots of different people. That's one side. Then there's the other addiction, which is having no sex with anyone, which is the other side. And they're both addictions. Do you understand? It's like one, one we call, what's the name we call for abstinence or celibacy? Celibacy, right? So, so that. And the, and the other is, what would you call it? Promiscuity. So, so the addiction is either one, is for one or the other. And as a result, you have, even if you're celibate, you often have spirits who believe in no sex, not allowed to have sex for the rest of your life. Um, you know, that's a part of being holy. They're the ones who connect with you and cause the person to be celibate. And then you often have the flip side of that, which is spirits over coking people, involving them in promiscuity with, in the form or in the guise of spirituality. And this is the trouble with pseudo spirituality is it always. Because it promotes the facade, it, it means it leads to addictions being met and the addictions cause the attraction and the attraction causes the spirit involvement in, this, in the spiritual form. And, uh, and so we see that happening a lot. So there in those examples, we're, we're defining addiction as something we <coughs> do to avoid our emotional self, aren't yes, we? Yes, yeah. 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 Or something we do to avoid uh, pain yeah. in our life. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, so following on from that... We've said it promotes dependency on external spirit influences, as you've said, and we actually desire spirits to provide energy and experiences for the purpose of comfort, reassurance, or to feel good and whole. Yes, yeah, so let's look at this. What happens then is we become sort of addicted to spiritual experiences. Um, I put that in quotation marks, spiritual experiences. So... So addiction to metaphysical spiritual experiences. So what often happens there is that, uh, for example, we see a lot of people that we meet um, who love going out of body <coughs> on a frequent basis because they get to travel the spirit world or places in the spirit world and they get to have different experiences and so they go out of body purposefully. But, uh, but oftentimes they're going out of body on a regular basis to, to ignore their life on earth or to get away from their life on earth or to not be challenged by their life on earth or to have these joyful experiences that they cannot have on earth. And as a result of that, they become addicted to some metaphysical experiences. And unfortunately, quite frequently, uh, spirits are in interfering with these experiences or helping them have these experiences. So they start believing that uh, they even start believing that they are a different person than they actually are. They, I've, we've, we've actually met people who, who have come to us and said, oh, I'm such and such and I lived 400 years ago. And we go, no worries. Um, and then we start talking to the spirit who's overcloaking them and the spirit disconnects from the person and then the person sort of almost comes to their senses and sort of wakes up and goes, oh... Um, and they look at you in a dazed way and they go, oh, um, who are you again? And <laughs> like, Because it, it was the spirit who was actually interacting with you. And then when, the, when you interact with the spirit, uh, the person dis disconnects uh, and, and then all of a sudden the person's allowed to be themselves and the spirit has gone away for a little while and we've, we've often had those kind of experiences. In fact, in fact that was our very first experience <laughs> with you, Alex, wasn't it, really? Um, yeah. Yeah. We also um, meet a lot of people who've changed their name. Hey, uh, <coughs> often through when they've had a um, an intense <coughs> spiritual experience, and they've found their true soul name, or their um, you know they've been rebirthed, and this is the real them. And very often, it's actually the spirit with them, uh, a spirit who's come to them in a time of stress or deep desire for change and avoidance of themselves, or um, a desire for their pseudo spiritual new pseudo spiritual life. That yes, they yeah. yeah, that they that they skip over what's really there, mm. and then they take on this name. And um, yeah, it's often those people are very challenged when we call them by their 
birth name uh, because obviously there's a lot of investment in this pseudo spiritual facade. Mm. Yeah. We, we have even found where um, we start talking to the person about their birth name and why they felt that they needed to get rid of their birth name. And within a very short period of time, they are already feeling the grief of their life when, when they were little. Mm. When they stay in their pseudo spiritual state and with their name that they that the spirit gave them they managed to avoid all of the pain of that life that they had when they were little yeah and so we've we've actually found it very counterproductive for many of them to change their name if you've cha- if you ever do decide to change your name make sure you're doing it to not avoid a whole group of emotions right so yeah. make sure that the the reason why you're doing it is is pure rather than just a reason to avoid, a way to avoid things. Um, because if it's a choice to avoid, quite often the spirit comes along and tells you the name they have, and that causes a closer bond between you and that spirit, and that spirit then gets to direct your entire life. In fact, we've met many, many hundreds and hundreds of people who their entire life is directed by spirits, and they really do not have any will of their own. Uh, as a result and very often that happens doesn't it when people even if they have a belief in God but they want to do God's will and so they open themselves and ask okay God what is your will Um, God's not going to God's will is that we find our own will and exercise our own personality on earth so very often spirits come along and go I'll tell you what to do and people end up feeling like they're doing God's will when actually it's a spirit and it may be a spirit who believes they're guiding them in a, in a positive way or it may be a spirit who has got some deeper, darker intentions in order to get their addictions filled through this person. So, mm. yeah. so you'll find in, this, uh, in pseudo-spirituality, many people have an experience, a, a spiritual experience, and it's like they become a different person instantly. Have you ever heard of those particular... There's many documented cases of it. And uh, like I said, many hundreds of people we've met have gone through that experience. The problem with that experience is it's not a real change. It's not a soul-based change. It's not a change inside of the person. It's just the person has... um, Oftentimes they've wanted to get away from their life before it happened and they just go away from their life and in comes a spirit and that spirit guides the rest of their lives. And, um, And when you start talking to the individual and talking to them about that potential of that being the truth to them, they're instantly enraged. So we've had so many conversations with people in that place who have gone from being nice and friendly and so-called loving one moment until we start talking about this subject, about how a spirit is overcloaking them and interfering with them. And instantly that spirit is so enraged that the person themselves has forgotten any sense of spiritual development at all and any sense of development of love and now they're just in a rageful anger with us telling us how we're wrong and there's this and that and there's all these other things. And, and straight away you can feel the spirit in a space where its authority over the individual is being challenged and as a result of that the spirit wants to prevent that from occurring. So the problem with all forms of pseudo-spirituality that involve spirit influence is that a lot of the times the spirit wants to con- maintain control over the individual and they are perfectly happy with the individual giving up control of their own self to the spirit. And uh, as soon as you start confronting that, that's a g- great sign. If anger is the response, then that's an immediate sign that there's something major wrong here with their spiritual development. Mm-hmm. Because it, it, it should be love that is the response. If, and if you were falsely accused of something occurring and you're in a state of love, what would happen? You would stay in a state of love even if you're falsely accused. So um, the reality is many of these people get very angry very rapidly. It's like they have a Jekyll and Hyde personality almost. And that is actually the case. They have a spirit over cloak personality and their own personality which they switch between. And many of them if they were, went to a doctor or something the doctor would say they're schizophrenic in their nature. And that's the reason why. Uh, can we just wait for the mic? That's it. Yeah, How anyway. would you suggest someone in that state... Can you hold the mic right in front <laughs> yeah, and ask... How would you suggest someone who uh, was in that state claim their own um, self again? 
Good question. The way to claim your own self in any state that is spirit influenced is this. Firstly, here, let's uh, draw a little uh, map, shall we? Like, are we prone to do? Just uh, grab out some of this so I can draw it bigger. So here's the person on earth. Here's the spirit influence that's around them. So this is the spirit who's influencing the person. The reason why that spirit can influence the person is because this person no longer wants to have control of their own life in some way. So this person here already must have a feeling of wanting to get away from their life. From their life, like their life. Right? And by life, you would include their emotional Including condition. Including their emotions. Their past, things that have happened to them in their past. Their past. Their shame, their sense of... Their, um, their, that's all part of the emotion, yep. but also their experiences. They want to forget their experience. Now, as soon as you have a strong desire inside of yourself to forget your own experiences and to reject your own past and to not deal with the emotions that are a part of your past, in other words, to not remember them and actually you process them and deal with them in a positive manner, you will be very, very tempted to try to get away from your life. For most people, they don't want to get away from their life so much that they're willing to commit suicide, but they still want to get away from their life a lot. You know, they don't like their life. Now, as soon as that happens, you are now inviting a person in the spirit world who would love to have your life <laughs> so that he or she can manipulate your life in some way to get their own addictions met. And that person will begin to have an influence over you, sometimes a very strong influence. Now, to reverse that situation, we have to go backwards as to why it happened. And why it happened was because we wanted to get away from our own life in the first place. So what we need to do is start embracing our own life and our own emotions and our own past and our own experiences. To do that, we have to go through an emotional, psychological process of embracing our life, that the things that actually happened to us in our past and work our way through them in an, in an emotional, present manner. When we do that, it is impossible for spirits to have a great deal of influence on us anymore. Does that make sense to everyone? If we don't do that, then every time we desire to step away from our life again, the spirit can have influence on us again. Now, if, the spirits, if we're always stepping away from our life, the spirits can maintain almost total control over us. Now, there are two forms of uh, what are classified as mental illnesses that... There are more than two, but there are two primary ones that the majority of people have heard of um, that, that are a part of these kind of influences with spirits. The first one is uh, called manic depression, which you would have heard of. Has everyone heard of that? It's a depression where you have very, very high highs, what are called highs, and very, very low lows. What's happening there is when you go into a high state, you are actually being spirit overcloaked, usually by more than one spirit. They pump you with their energy and keep you awake as long as possible so that they can experience what they've missed out on experiencing in Earth for as long as possible. And this is why many people in the high spend a long time, usually 23 hours out of 24 awake, doing all sorts of things they would not normally do. Now... When spirits do this, they have an effect on your physical and spiritual bodies. So much that the physical and spiritual bodies start to be degraded in their condition and the spirit body in particular can no longer maintain its energy. As that degrades, eventually it gets to the point where the spirits can no longer manipulate the connection and the spirit connection breaks off. And that's when the person goes into a deep depression, which is where they would normally be avoiding their day-to-day -day emotions. And then once, their spirit, once they recover from that physically and spiritually, 
they then start going back up again and then the spirits can influence them again, take them back up into a high and then they stay in a high for a period, the manic phase for a period. And then you have that effect happening. Now they are just spirits affecting the whole process. In many religions, a lot of people view that state as actually a good state. They actually can see the difference in many religions, particularly when you go to Africa or South America. They can see the difference in the, in the overcloak state compared to the normal state and they call such a person a prophet. So they don't actually give it a name, manic depression. They call it being a prophet. Uh, it's the same, often the same state. Another state that we've heard of, that you would have heard of, is schizophrenia, and I'm not that sure. Schizophrenia. That's not right. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, schizophrenia is a state where a person is hearing voices constantly. Hearing, and really what they're doing is they're hearing the voices of spirits, talking to them constantly. Some of those spirits are what you would call benevolent. In fact, the majority of them generally are. So they want the person to die or they want the person to do damaging things or they want the person to do all sorts of other There's things. There's malevolent. I think you said benevolent. Malevolent, sorry. <laughs> and then there are some that are benevolent, that, that, uh, but it's rare. But yeah. There are some that are benevolent who want to help the person or, th or so-called want to help the person. Um, this kind of person generally switches between one state and the next or one spirit and the next sequentially and so therefore it's very difficult uh, dealing with their day-to-day -day life and uh, oftentimes you're dealing with a different person every time their character or personality switches you're actually dealing with a different spirit in the spirit world and the key is to address each spirit and work out why that spirit is attracted to the person and once you've worked all those things out, you can see what emotions in the person, the emotion that, that the person themselves on earth is avoiding. So whenever a person on earth is avoiding something, this causes a much greater attraction for spirit influences upon the person. So pseudo-spirituality promotes avoidance. It actually supports avoidance. It doesn't confront it. It supports addiction and avoidance and facade. Because of that reason, you often see many people who are involved in those forms of spirituality overcloaked or severely influenced by spirits. And you often can be talking to them one minute and then it's like, who are you now? You're like a different person talking to them the next minute. And the primary reason why is that during that time there was a transition of what spirit was controlling the person or themselves controlling themselves and then a spirit controlling them. And you often see that relationship. Thanks, Dan. <coughs> Hi. I was just wondering, um, do the spirits also, do they, because they're pumping someone with energy, do they lose energy themselves? They do, yes. And eventually they cannot maintain the amount of energy they need to maintain to pump the person full of energy. So they then can no longer do it and they have to, get, they have to disconnect for a period of time. But because their emotional addiction is to control the person to do certain things. So let's say the spirit is missing out on sex in the spirit world and they want to overcloak a person on earth who will engage freely in sex if they overcloak them. Then they overcloak them, pump them full of the energy, help their sexual experiences until the person gets so exhausted that they can't even maintain their own body anymore and, and the spirit can't maintain the connection anymore and the spirit disconnects and the person goes into a huge slump straight away, remembers what they've done, feels ashamed, feels even worse... And then the cycle continues because the person doesn't want to feel what they're feeling and so they step away even further. As soon as they recover physically, then the spirit overcloaks them again. Yeah. So, so the main way um, they, uh, what not control isn't the right word, uh, influence uh, people is, is through this sort of energy thing, like they're pumping energy or, or giving negative energy to make someone feel bad. Or well, let's define energy. Energy... What is emotion? Energy, uh, emotion is really energy in motion. Right? Many people have heard of that. So energy in emotion, you could say, is E, motion. Right? And, and the reality is that it's our emotional condition 
our desire for certain emotions to be met that, that we're not willing to met, meet within ourselves or in a pure way. We just want the addiction met for that emotion any time from any person. And it's our addiction that creates the or establishes the connection between a spirit who's willing to give us that addiction, that emotion we want, as long as we're willing to do what he or she wants. So there is an exchange where we're willing to do what he or she wants so that we get what we want. And uh, that's what creates the overcloaking or the spirit influence. If you are not willing to exchange emotions with people in any addictive manner, in other words, I'm not willing to do something for you if I notice that you are in an addiction and want something from me in that addiction, and you are not willing to do something for me when I am in an addiction or you notice in me something that seems to be an addiction, then it's very difficult for us to give each other an exchange of emotions mm. that would validate both of us. And it's exactly the same with our spirit friends. If we wish to give them something and we wish to receive something in return, then there's a high likelihood we will be influenced. If we're unwilling to engage in that energy or emotional exchange, then there's a very low likelihood of us being influenced by spirits, no matter what condition we're in. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. We go to Laura and then across. Just as we're going to Laura, that kind of links in with one of the other points that we said, which is about threats and blackmail. So yeah, so we uh, need to speak yeah, a bit more about that. Yep. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, I just recently... Um, had a memory of being a very uh, a very young child and all the adults were projecting, like, hurry up and speak, we're not interested in what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And the emotion just, my heart just sank and I just felt so small, so insignificant. And then a voice, very clearly, very loving voice, said, don't worry, one day they'll, they'll listen to you. Mm -hmm. And the emotion from the distress went straight into um, comfort and reassurance. Mm -hmm. And um, now that I'm focusing on that voice of the spirit, it was actually like one day they'll listen to you. It was quite angry. Mm -hmm. And to disconnect from that spirit, I'm, um, I have to release that causal emotion before... So there's still this spirit that's with me. That's correct, Laura. So what, what you need to do, the emotion that you didn't want to feel when you were a child, which is understandable because you were only a child, right, mm -hmm. um, was this emotion that nobody wants to know you, nobody wants to care about what you were saying or feeling or that, that emotion... And the spirit was willing to work on that emotion to give you support and make you feel comforted. But, but the spirit wants to manipulate that emotion as well, wants to create the bond. There are some spirits who are not like that. You know, they're more benevolent and they're willing to say to you, somebody will listen to you in the future without wanting something in return. But the problem is, is you've got to be able to feel the spirit to feel which kind of spirit it is, Right. And for many of us, we just want the addiction met. We don't really care. So um, would there be an investment in the spirit of not wanting me to go to that causal emotion? Definitely. It, when I try to go to it, I feel pain, but I don't feel emotion. I just feel yes. pain. Every spirit that's in a codependent relationship with us doesn't want us to go to the emotion that will cause us to disconnect from the codependent relationship. Just the same as any person on earth is. And prayer is the constant prayer of re reliving that moment because I've gone... It's prayer, but also a desire to actually stop getting the addiction met and to deal with or address the fear that you have that you'll never be loved. Does that make sense? So, so there has to be some kind of desire developed within the individual to overcome the emotion through a process of experiencing it before the spirit can disconnect. Because otherwise, the desire in the person is, please... Please give me the emotion, please give me the emotion, going around to everybody. And of course you'll have spirits attracted to you who are totally happy to give you the emotion you want as long as they get something in return. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. If we can come down the front here. Yep. Um, back onto the previous point you had. Yep. If none of us are living this joyful, wonderful life that we should be living, therefore we're all being overcloaked because as soon as we could release an emotion and get rid of that little bogeyman. Oh, gosh, there's another one. Even though I've risen up closer to the goal, I've got a better bogeyman and then a better bogeyman. <laughs> a better bogeyman. <laughs> <laughs> um, not all spirit influence, of course, is, is uh, malevolent. Can so you tell? Like if you've got a test? It's quite easy to tell, yes, uh, because spirits who, spirits who are friendly 
are not going to try to influence your will. Spirits who are malevolent always attempt to influence your will. In a, when I say influence, they want to control your will in a negative direction. Spirits who are positive never want to control your will in any direction. So, so if we look at it in terms of spirits, and we've given some talks about positive influences versus negative influences from the spirit world, but if you look at the two types of spirit influence, let's call it, let's call it bad, <laughs> shall we, in terms of a simple explanation, and good. <laughs> good meaning it's going to help your soul progress, going to help your soul grow, it's going to make you more loving, more truthful, more honest, more... All of those things. Bad meaning it's going to keep you stagnant, it's going to keep you in your same emotions, keep you in your addictions and all of those kind of things. So that's the definition in this case. I'll just use those terms because it's simple and easy to write as well. Now, if we look at the type of influence, we don't have to progress very far in our spiritual development to release bad influences. There's only really one or two things we have to do. One is to become more ethical. So if we personally are ethical, and I've given a talk recently about ethics, it's not on the net yet, but if we're more ethical, meaning that we are more unwilling to live in unethical relationships with any person or spirit, that we are willing to live in a loving way, in other words, we're willing to uh, give to others, but we're not willing to take from others unless they have a willingness to give, and also that it's in harmony with the principles of love. So some people are willing to give, but it's not in harmony with the principles of love. Some people want to give because they then get an addiction met, for example. If we are in ethical arrangements with people, it's very, very hard for a negative individual, whether that person is on earth or in the spirit world, doesn't matter, to influence us in a negative direction. Very difficult. Because that person has lost then all method of control because the way they control us is through our addictions not being ethical not not being um, met that through sorry through our addictions being met in an unethical manner is the way that they control us so would you say it's a willingness to compromise integrity yes yep. and that was the second thing i wanted to raise if we have personal integrity and we know ourselves, and we can feel, yes, now I want something from that person, and we notice that within ourselves, then that is the time when it is very dangerous for us to involve, like to be involved in an exchange of any type with any person, whether it's on earth or in the spirit world, because if we lack integrity, then any person who wants us to, to do something for them well, all they need to do is feed us with our lack of integrity, whatever that demands, and at the same time, they can then give us what we demand as a result, and we enter this bond, if you like, or codependent addiction. So uh, are many of you, uh, OFA, or understand about codependent addictions on, with relationships between people on Earth? Yep. So you'd understand that with a codependent addiction, one person has a need which the other person is willing to give. And then this person has a need, which the opposite person is willing to give. And because the two are willing to supply each other's needs in a codependent manner, it draws the relationship together. This is exactly the same with every spirit relationship. So any spirit who comes to us and influences us is in a codependent addiction with us, in a codependent relationship. If we have ethics and integrity... It's very, very hard for any person to be in a codependent relationship with us because we refuse to be dependent on another person for what they give us emotionally. Does everyone follow that? Mm -hmm. And if we, if we refuse to do that, then it's very, very difficult for any spirit to then influence me in a negative direction. So to develop those two qualities is quite important within us. If we can develop those two qualities... We can prevent any negative spirit influence from occurring in our life generally. And, uh, and there have been many people we've known who have done that and, and, to and disconnected from spirits over a period of time through that process. Yeah. AJ, would you say that that requires a level of humility in order to... Uh, well, it requires self-analysis, doesn't it? Like yeah. We need to look at ourselves... 
And we go, okay, like, what do I want from Mary? So I've got to look at myself and go, what do I want from Mary? I want Mary to think I'm beautiful and nice and lovely and I want her to... These are all the feelings that I might want from her, right? And then, okay, what, what does, does Mary, Mary want, want from me? Well, she to wants feel to feel safe, safe and secure and all those kind of things. So as long as I make her feel safe and secure, she might give me the emotions I want. Now, most of the time we do that in a very unconscious manner, but we still do it. Now, if I'm willing to feel that Mary... No, Mary's actually feeling very unsafe... And if I make her feel safe, while that might be great, I might give you nice she feelings. might give me nice feelings as a result, I'm not helping her soul grow. So therefore, it would be unethical for me to make her feel safe. She needs to go through whatever is making her feel unsafe. Does that make sense? And if she goes through that, she can then decide for herself whether she <laughs> wants to give me any nice feelings or not, without it being a bartering system where I'm exchanging one feeling for another. Now, if I have some ethics, I'll go, okay, I know that I badly want this feeling from Mary, this feeling that I'm a nice fella and, you know, I'm sexy and I'm gorgeous and <laughs> she's into me and all that kind of stuff, right? And so I badly want that from her, so I know that there must be some unhealed emotions inside of me that cause me to want that from her, that I need to heal. So rather than trying to get that from her, I need to heal that inside of me. I need to sort that out, why I have all of those unhealed emotions inside of me. So you imagine if I heal that inside of myself, I will no longer feel like I need that from Mary. I will also no longer feel like I need to give her emotions that make her feel safe and secure. Now, if she does exactly the same thing, she no longer wants emotions from me that make her feel safe and secure, and she's no longer willing to barter with me sexually to get the feeling of being safe and secure, then we are now our true selves. Now if we come together, it will be based upon a desire for each other that's pure and not based on a codependent emotional addiction. Can everyone understand that? Now if, now if Mary has passed, mm -hmm. the situation is no different. Mm -hmm. I'm still on earth and Mary's passed... If I have this emotion coming out of me that I want to make, be made feel good and nice and gorgeous and, you know, and sexy and all that kind of stuff, and Mary's past, there's a chance that... And if she's willing to bar to that for making her feel safe and secure, then she'll give me that emotion and I can give her the safe and secure emotion. We'll still be in a codependent addiction. It makes no difference whether we have, we're living on earth or whether one of us have passed or whether both of us have passed we are still going to have to work our way through whether we're being loving or not with our addictions. Mm. Now, pseudo-spirituality says that, oh, none of that matters. Pseudo-spirituality says, oh, it's great to give a person. That person, what they call it, the different forms of... There's even books written about this on earth where there's different forms of love that we like. What's it called? The love Five Languages, languages of Love? Yeah. And sorry to the writer, I'm sorry, but um, you're way off. And, and so the languages of love are, oh, I want safety. When I get safety, I feel loved. Well, that's an addiction. That's not love. That's a desire for a certain addiction to be met. Now, when you have healed every uh, fe feeling of fear within yourself, you'll automatically feel safe. Mm. So, of course, you won't at that point in time feel like you need the addiction of your safety being met right at that moment. And so when a man comes along and he tries to make you feel safe, you go, what are you doing that for? <laughs> like, I want you to love me, not make me feel safe. Like, <laughs> I'm already safe. <laughs> I was safe before you come along. I'll be safe if you go. <laughs> I'll be right. And Just it actually <laughs> feels quite condescending then. It feels condescending yeah. then. It's no longer yeah. codependent because I, I feel a repulsion now to any codependent addiction. Because I've healed the emotion inside of me. And that's, the, that's how uh, things happen with regard to spirits too. I can no longer be attracted to a spirit giving me an emotion once I've healed the emotion inside of myself. Just like I can no longer be attracted to a person on earth. Yeah? So really in answer to the gentleman's question, it's two parts, isn't it? If there's one, a willingness just to have in personal integrity will reduce a lot. Yep. But then... The full completion of it is when we've dealt with all the 
Yeah. The emotions, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's yeah. true. Like, obviously, it's a growing process. We'll yeah. deal with one emotion, we'll deal with another emotion, and as we deal with different emotions, different spirits leave us and other ones come. But, but we only have to deal with a couple of different feelings, the ethics and, uh, and integrity, to stop engaging these spirits emotionally. And that can be done quite quickly. Like, you can do that within a week mm -hmm. in your life, basically, to stop engaging the spirits. But, but for many people, they want to engage the spirits. They want the feeling so badly that they're willing to engage anybody, <laughs> let alone a spirit. Yep. So they do. Yeah. Now, Yvette's had her hand up for some time, so we'll go back to Yvette. Uh, uh, no, we want to go back to Yvette. If we, we want to go back to Yvette because she's had her hand up for some time yeah. before then, and I said she would... Yep, Thank you. Far away. <laughs> um, so I've had many conversations with people where they have this blank look on their face for, say, 30 seconds as if they're really glazed. Um, and I always used to think before I found out about spirit attachment that they were just bored yeah. of, of what I was saying. So is that is a spirit coming in then and getting them to kind of switch out? And is that because of something I've said to them? Usually when people go glazed, there is generally one emotion primarily, and that is whatever subject was being discussed before then, they don't want to be emotionally involved with. All right? Now, generally what happens is a person steps away from that discussion inside of themselves. Now, at that point in time, it depends on how mediumistic they are as to whether a spirit will overcloak them or they'll just be in a dazed state. It just depends completely on, you know, what their previous relationship with spirits has basically been. For, for some people, their previous relationship hasn't been established and so they just stay in a day state until you've changed the subject. <laughs> and once you change the subject, oh, that's a subject I'm interested in, in a way they engage again uh, uh, without to there being too much spirit influence. If it's, a, if it's a person who has had a lot of spirit influence in their life and is more mediumistic than that, then oftentimes a spirit will come and engage that subject. So you'll see a small glazed period or a, or a switch in the personality of the individual. And then from that moment on, when you're talking about the same subject, the spirit's talking rather than the person. And then when you stop talking about that subject, the spirit goes away because he's not interested in the next subject and back comes the person. Um, and these kind of transactions happen very, very frequently in our day-to-day -day life. The majority of you would be absolutely frightened out of your wits to know how often it happens in our day-to-day -day life. There's no need to be frightened, though. It's just understanding of, of what's going on emotionally inside of us that causes us to make the decisions that we make. Yeah. I see it often in audiences as well when there's a pressure behind the person to ask the question and I often feel like it's, it's not... If that's relating, it's not the person who's just got the question. There's a spirit going, you've got to ask this now. You've got to ask this now. Yeah. You've got to ask this now. It's like, oh, I've got yeah. to put my hand up. I don't even want my hand up. Yeah. I don't want my face on television. <laughs> I, don't yeah. Yeah. I don't want my face on the internet. Oh, I've got to put my hand up. Yeah. It's, like, it's like somebody's doing this to you. Almost, yeah. you know, yeah. like, and, and a lot of that is connected with your own emotion too, though, because they can't do that with you without there being some yeah. kind of emotion inside of you. Now, sometimes the emotion is good emotion, like an emotion where you want to help somebody is an emotion that's a positive emotion that's loving. So you might feel the spirit with you, you might have met them in their sleep state, you might feel, feel compassion for them in their sleep state, and so you want to help them. And so you feel impelled to put up your hand and ask the question for them because of that love that you have for them. Or it could be a codependent addiction. The key is to be self-analytical. Yeah. To, to be able to see what's going on inside of yourself, that what motivates the, the different things going on in terms of discussions and so forth. Now, when I say self-analytical, the fastest way to be self-analytical is to actually feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, you have a discussion with me and I'm feeling like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling like, yeah, I think I will engage uh, on this discussion. It's a bit boring, this, you know, this discussion, but, <laughs> oh, you know, she seems to be a nice person, so I'll, I'll engage her. Now, am I really committed in the discussion? <laughs> no. So if I was truly honest and loving, what would I say? You're boring me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might not say exactly not. like that if I'm loving. <laughs> yeah. but I might say, I'm bored with this 
topic I'm not of interested discussion. In so topic, it's not yeah. your boring me because <laughs> you, you might be very interesting on other topics. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just this particular topic I don't find much interest in. So if a person comes up to me now and speaks about, you know, what happened in rugby league last weekend, um, <laughs> I'm not that attracted to that, to that uh, discussion. If it, they're talking about what happened in the AFL last weekend, <laughs> then I'm a little more attracted to that <laughs> subject, but still not very high on my list of, uh, of priorities. Does that make sense? And there might be, you know, inside of any individual, because of our personality and nature, we have literally thousands of topics that may interest us, but also many thousands of topics that may bore us or, or may when we don't feel that interested in at the time. And the key is to be honest and truthful about that so that the person then can choose, oh, well, I, do I want to engage them or not? One of the most terrible things I find engaging any individual is just sitting back there going, yes, 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 yes. And inside, there's the feeling. You can feel from the person of, they're not really interested. They don't really care. They're not engaged. They don't really want to be there. It's far better if they just say, look, I don't want to talk about this. I'd go, you beauty. Let's, okay. play, let's play ping pong. <laughs> yeah, or let's do something or, or, or not talk about it or something, you know, like something different. And the, the big issue that we have with most of our interactions is that we're not prepared to be honest, truthful and loving at the same time. Mm -hmm. And because we're not prepared to do that, this is what causes people to disengage from conversations. That's what causes the blank looks on their faces. And it's what causes our spirits to also often be involved in conversations that the person does not want to be involved in. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we all just engage truthfully then a lot of these things would never occur. Mm. Oh, yep. Yep. Um, You've got to hold you the mic. You've got to hold the mic. You've got to hold it. Oh, I think I'm, it's, I'm finding it well, not exactly. <laughs> Overwhelming. <laughs> uh, the three if you can just hold the mic. About dealing with uh, the bad spirits well, you s uh, was the ethics, and I just wanted to... You said you were putting uh, something on ethics. Yes, um, you see... If we're Integrity and in, in the self-analysis. Yep. If we're so ethical, what I mean by ethical is yeah. um, if I have a demand upon you that I am not willing to meet for myself and I notice you have a demand upon me that you are not willing to meet for yourself, then we're both not being ethical in an interaction we're having. So if I'm not willing to do something for myself that I am willing to do for you, or wanting, or wanting you to do for me, then I am not ethical. I am not having the same demand upon myself as I am upon you. Now, any time that happens in our life, we are actually placing ourselves in a position where other people can manipulate us. And as soon as another person can manipulate us, we're there placing ourselves in danger. Whether that person's on earth or not is immaterial. They can be a spirit in the spirit world or a person on earth. It doesn't matter. We are placing ourselves in a position where we can be manipulated because we are not having the same demands upon another that we have upon ourselves. If we're ethical and we do have the same requirements of ourselves as another, then there's a higher likelihood that we would never engage in addictive behaviour with other people. Because we'd see, ah, oh, I have a feeling in myself that I feel unloved. I wouldn't expect you to make me feel loved. I would actually firstly address the emotion inside of me why I'm unloved and I would work my way through that which is a lot of grief involved generally with that. Once I come out at the other side of that now we can have an interaction where I'm not demanding something of you that was unethical. You don't have to make me feel loved in a transaction. That's the re reality. And if I'm saying to you you do from an emotional perspective then I'm being unethical. So, so ethics is a very easy way of being able to separate uh, yourself from spirit influence because most spirit influence people are not being ethical with the spirit and the spirit's not being ethical with them. Yeah. And so it's a very fast way of disconnecting yourself from spirit influence. Okay. Someone had their hand. I just wanted to ask you, before when we, you said, oh, if we say let God's will be, you know, we're open to God's will, that's when spirits come in. Often, rather yes. Rather than because God's desire, what we want to do. 
God's desire for us is that we discover ourselves. You know, we're talking about um, uh, pseudo-spirituality versus true spirituality. Now, in pseudo-spirituality, there's a lot of emphasis, as we've been talking about, on the facade and avoiding our real self. Now, God's desire for us is that we... Because God created us with this beautiful personality when it's in harmony with love. So God's desire for us is to discover ourselves. Uh, And if that's damaged initially, to discover that damage and have the courage to release it so that then we would be our true selves as God created us, which is a beautiful, unique personality with desires of their own um, that we can follow in harmony with love. So when when we opt for God's will... Often we're just saying we're in that indecision um, injury that AJ spoke of earlier. We say, I don't know what to do. God, could you tell me what to do? Which is really actually us avoiding what's already inside of us. Or avoiding making a decision for ourselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of fear involved in that. Mm -hmm. God's desire is that we confront our fear and discover ourselves and heal ourselves. And then whatever we do with our will will be loving. And so that's why when we say, okay, God's will, uh, it's, it's usually a huge injury and an avoidance and it's missing the mark of truth, which is God wants us to know our own unique will in harmony with love because that's always going to serve ourselves, God, everyone else mm. once we use our will in harmony with love. Mm. Yeah. Is that clearer? Mm. Yeah. So if you are indecisive and you... You ask something, you might talk to God. Like, would you maybe just get a feeling in your heart? I mean, I sometimes I get a message up here. But is that maybe spirit telling me? Yes. A spirit telling yes. me? You know, whereas maybe I should be getting a feeling in my heart. Mm. Yeah. Which is more me or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it will require some self-analysis as well. So looking at your own feelings and being able to feel that spirit to for you to be able to understand if that is actually a benevolent spirit so someone who's guided by love or someone who's guided by wanting you to stay in addiction and f- to create a codependence with them there's going to be no harm to your soul following the advice of somebody who's loving there's going to be harm to your soul following the advice of somebody who's unloving so so the key is to remember that spirits can be either loving or unloving and we've, we need to know the difference if we're going to follow their advice. So when somebody's there giving us some advice, there's no harm in listening to the advice. The key is to ask ourselves whether the advice is loving or unloving. Many of the schizophrenic people that I talked about earlier get advice like, kill that person, kill yourself. Now, that's very unloving advice. And so therefore, um, it would be very sad if the person engaged that unloving device it's going advice it's going to harm their soul as well as the soul of the spirit who's giving them that advice so it's far better if the person reflects and goes okay yes we need to work out you know whether this person is giving me loving advice or unloving advice if they're giving me loving advice it's my choice still to follow it or not i'm allowed to choose that's what free will is. Mm-hmm. Free will is the gift to choose what I desire to do. Whether it's, whether it's loving or unloving, I have that free will to choose which one I do. And the danger is, as you've correctly just thought of, oh, when, we, when we think that is me, or that is my higher self giving that advice, rather than being connected to ourself and realising, no, that's somebody else telling me and pseudo spirituality encourages us not to examine that it says yes yes that's your higher self yes you know because it it promotes a, an avoidance of our true feelings a heart connection so um it's great that you're now thinking hang on wh- well who is that telling me that because yeah. and it, it might be someone very friendly and yes. who's helping your life out uh, or it might be someone different to that or it might be someone just feeding an addiction the key is for you to make the choice about which one that is mm. and to follow the advice dependent upon what kind of person is giving the advice. It's like it, if you went along to uh, you know, some kind of event where you noticed every single person in the audience seemed to have a really terrible, messed up life and their life was still continuing to be really, really bad and they weren't happy at all and then they were coming up to you to give you advice... <laughs> then you'd be going, oh, I don't know if I should follow this <laughs> advice, right? The problem with spirits doing it is that, is that 
we believe they're all somehow work their life out when most of them you have yet to work their life out or well, most of the ones that are on earth have yet to work their life out anyway and and so we follow the advice of people in just as bad a condition as what I've just described without any consideration whatsoever as to what their condition is and what kind of advice they're giving and that's a very harmful thing to do to our life mm -hmm. and in the end we will be harmed by that choice and decision if we follow the advice of people we don't know and we don't know their condition. And that's always going to harm us at some point. So the key is to use your beautiful will, the gift mm -hmm. that God has given you, to work out whether the person is loving or unloving or whether work out whether they're being truthful or not truthful. Decide for yourself. And once you decide for yourself, you have the choice then to do whatever you wish. The, the problem with pseudo-spirituality is that often it encourages the, is, is encourages the abdication of the will. So in other words, we give up our own will because we've got this person talking to us every day saying this is what we should do, who we believe is God. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we have this friend of ours who, when we first met him, he wake up every single morning and he would say to himself, whatever you want me to do, I will do today. And he got a heap of messages about what, straight away, he got a heap of messages about what he should do that day. And he engaged every single one of those things that he could do that day. He engaged, so, so, or he followed every single piece of advice he was given. And one of the first questions I asked him when we met was, do you know who's giving you the advice? And he had no idea who's giving him the advice. And if he could have seen the spirits who were giving the advice, he would never have listened to their advice. Now, those spirits encouraged him to leave his family, which he now regrets. They were encouraging him to leave most of his friends, which he now regrets. And, and they were actually encouraging him to, to actually die, mm -hmm. which he started to recognise as well. Right? And then he started realising that that group of spirits weren't as nice as what he originally thought. He thought they were God. Mm. They were telling him, the voices were telling him that it was God talking to him and so forth. But the advice was all sorts of very unloving advice. So it's definitely not God giving unloving advice. Become <laughs> yeah, across to. Yeah. Um, I suffered from uh, nocturnal panic attacks mm -hmm. and it took me eight arduous, long arduous years to, um, res of research to find that um, I was sort of being attacked, uh, shall we say, by, by spirit entities or energies. Mm -hmm. And I found a, um, an esoteric healer mm -hmm. and in one session I was released and I haven't had a panic attack since no uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what he actually did? Because it just absolutely turned my life around. It was fantastic. And I have the best life of anybody I know now. And But prior to that, I, I was going through absolute hell. Um, I can explain what, he, what happened. Oh, um, good. Certainly. Um, he probably is not aware of what happened, actually, himself. So, so it's good for you to know what actually happened. Here's yourself. You were, from a quite a young age, uh, had a spirit attached to you who was attached to and attracted to you because of fear. Fear of things that happened in your childhood that she saw happen and she had happened even worse things in her childhood and she was attracted to your fear and she would heighten your fear. Does that make sense? Um, you've, the more I talk about it, you'll find you possibly in the end will even know her personality and so forth. Now, um, what would happen in, at, in night times for you is that you'd have these male spirits come along, right, who would be attracted to the combination of your fears and attracted to her fear in particular, mm -hmm. and then they would try to attack her through you or you via her through the fear, the relationship that you had. As a result, you're very, very frightened. You've been very fr frightened from a very young age, yes? Yeah. Now, what he did was he didn't get rid of those spirits. He helped her go. Does that make sense? When she disconnected from you, 
you had only your fear again to deal with rather than the combination of your and her fear. And also, these spirits who were attacking were attracted to her primarily and her fear primarily, not necessarily to yours. And so for that reason, you no longer feel that attack and therefore no longer go into a panic. However, can I point out one thing? You still have some childhood fear to deal with. And while you have that childhood fear inside of you, there is the potential of some other woman spirit who's afraid coming and attaching herself to you at some point in the future and the same dynamic being set up again. Now, because it, the reason why it hasn't happened for the last eight years is because once you release the, the connection, you are in less fear. And as a result, there's less spirits wanting to connect to you who are also in fear. Does that make sense? As soon as the connection uh, is, is severed, um, that's what has occurred. So what this esoteric healer did was help you disconnect from that spirit who was in fear. Which is a very good, lovely gift, yes, that the person gave you. Yeah, yeah. You need to speak into the microphone so that the audience can hear you though. <laughs> so, so um, and that's what's happened to you in your life. Now... What would even be better, though, for yourself is to address the childhood fear that still remains within you. And the only way you're going to address that is by actually feeling it. Now, a lot of people believe that if they feel it, they will attract a bad spirit again. That is not the case. It's only if you deny it that you'll attract them again. Does that make sense? The key is to feel it and release it. And then it's gone for you from, for good. And there, from that moment on, there is no chance of you ever being overcloaked by another spirit. What other thing the esoteric healer did for you, though, which is perhaps less helpful, is there is now a spirit who is a friend of the esoteric healer who is now protecting you from being influenced by any fear-based spirit. Does that make sense? So this friend of the esoteric healer feels he's doing you a favour and you believe he is, of course, because, because he knows that you still have this inside of you. So what he's trying to do is, is use his effort to prevent this influence from other spirits while you still have this fear within you. Now, if you allow yourself to release that fear, he won't need to be there anymore either. Does that make sense? That's what's going on for you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. The reason why these kind of events happen is because uh, around many healers, there are spirits who have a deep desire to help people on earth, but they're not sure how to do it. And for many of them, the way they do it is by protecting the person from other people they feel are the negative influences. So this spirit believes he's doing you a favour, but in the long run, you're still going to have to deal with the fear. Does that make sense? Yep which has been there from a very young age through childhood events that you're aware of, yes? Yep. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, let's proceed right, down there. Yep. Let's, um, you've covered a lot of what we've got written here. Because mm -hmm. um, we want to get on to the sexual yeah, addictions. Well. Yep, <laughs> that's always the bit <laughs> where, where, where are we, we up to time-wise? Well, we need to probably leave that section. Uh, we're going to put this outline on the net so any of you want to read the additional things that you've lost uh, or whatever. We yeah. want to get on to the sexual addictions because, because it is a big part of uh, what we notice in pseudo-spirituality. So. All right, so let's just go to pseudo-spirituality meets sexual addictions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so pseudo-spirituality looks for reasons and beliefs to hide behind the sexual addiction. Rather than confront it. Yes. And we talk, we've listed here two different ways that that can happen. So, if I, will I just go ahead and outline the first and then... Uh, perhaps we can... Does everyone understand what Mary has said there? I, no? I think you need the examples so to illustrate it. So, we need to it. use yeah. some examples perhaps to illustrate it. So, yeah. let's go on to the examples and, and then we'll illustrate yeah. the point. So, yeah. when we have a lot of sexual shame, for example, and we don't want to confront the sexual shame, so that's shame that's in us from childhood, we're carrying it and we don't want to confront that terrible feeling inside of ourselves, we often promote sexual suppression and we choose a form of spirituality that is a vehicle for suppression. Hmm. 
So does everyone understand that? So let's start with the emotion of sexual shame. Or sometimes we feel it as sexual guilt, which often comes from uh, the way in which our parents have treated us when we've touched ourselves sexually or something like that when we're very young. We often get a lot of shame uh, projected at us and a lot of anger and rage projected at us at a ch- as a child. So this sexual shame and guilt builds within us. And sometimes our parents already have it, so then that causes us to already have it. So now, which way do we respond to it? There's usually one of two different ways. One way is to reject it completely and live a life of sexual suppression. Double P? Yep. Yes? Now, if we do choose to do that, we will choose a spiritual form or a spiritual process that actually helps us do that. That promotes that. That promotes yeah. that. So it might promote celibacy, for example. You know, it might promote living, it might view all forms of sexuality as not being holy. So we, we, we take on this sort of very, what I suppose you could call a Catholic view, which is, the priesthood is the holiest, they're the holiest, and the nuns are the holiest because they are the ones who don't have sex with anyone. Right? And, and we have a tendency then to take on that particular viewpoint. Even where we begin to live our own life in a similar manner. So in other words, we, know we don't wish to engage in relationships if they involve sex, for example. So you have many people going down that track, <coughs> rejecting completely their sexuality and living a life of sexual suppression and choosing forms of beliefs that support their suppression. Yes? So that would involve some kind of Eastern philosophies as well where desire is judged, would you say? Yes. Uh, sometimes, some types of Eastern philosophies, uh, they actually believe in the suppression of all desire. Have you heard of that? Yes. So, in other words, they believe that if you have desire, you are yet to be spiritually developed. Right? And there are many forms of Eastern <coughs> religion that are based around this one premise that desire causes all forms of problems. Right? And I can't agree with it at all. God created us to have desire. I just believe the desire must be like, addressed in a loving manner. But... Uh, but unfortunately, many believe suppression of all desire is the, is the way to live your life. And that often comes from deeper, unhealed emotions about childhood events that have occurred to the individual. Yeah. Uh, and so that's also um, predominant within societies. For instance, I've been involved in a yogic tradition yep. and we were taught that you, you know, you might have your household phase where you raise your children, but then you would go off and you would leave your partner and you would go on your own spiritual journey. Yes. And that obviously appealed to me most recently because of all this shame and guilt of what yep. I had done in the past. It also appeals for other emotional reasons besides sexual reasons. So being special and... Being special, also not wanting to be controlled by, by your love for another not wanting to feel the potential of rejection from love, like the other person rejecting you. So we often reject other people before they'll reject us. There's all sorts of emotional reasons why we'll leave somebody that we've spent, spent most of our life with um, and, and not all of them are loving. Yes. Mm. And, but they're, they're actually saying that in order to do certain higher spiritual practices that you can't be having sex or yeah. that you can't. So that fits in with that, obviously. Exactly. So, and I disagree with that completely. God gave uh, a woman a vagina and a man a penis. So that means from God's perspective, having such organs are holy in themselves. It's a holy creation in itself. Any, any type of religious belief or any type of spiritual belief or practice that promotes the misuse of them or the complete non-use of them right, is in itself obviously flawed. Right? From a logical perspective, it's flawed. So, so any type of practice that involves those kind of things is flawed. So whenever a religious 
person or a person on a certain spiritual path promotes to us that we to have a higher form of faith or a higher form of spirituality, we must uh, reject our sexuality. They are automatically out of harmony with logic, but they're also automatically out of harmony with the creation of our own body. So therefore, it can't be spiritual. I, I actually feel it's not spiritual. It's the complete opposite. Yeah. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. The second so, thing we may do is um, we... Sorry? Yeah, sorry. Just, wanna, the, just um, uh, wanna, on that first point, yeah, though, yeah. we more? talked about two different things. So we might be attracted to a path that promotes sexual suppression or we will just judge sexuality as dirty and, and celibacy as holy and pure. But we might... We're still carrying that shame and it might manifest itself even... For example, a priest who... It becomes engaged with pedophilia or uh, a monk who lords celibacy but is continually fighting this kind of sexual um, desire and they're, they're judging it through their shame. Yeah, and, and I've seen uh, like even, even people who are meant to be well-developed on that path of sexual suppression, if we could call it that, such as the Dalai Lama. He has even commented that he often has trouble controlling his sexual urges, he calls it. And, and I don't think it's a trouble. I think the trouble is not recognising them uh, as, a, as a part of his spiritual nature. Mm -hmm. um, instead, what he's doing is trying to deny them as a part of his spiritual nature, which is why we finish up having trouble with them. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yep. There's so, so much about sexuality. So we need to yep. understand that uh, this sexual suppression uh, as a form of spirituality is never going to enhance our life it is never going to be completely successful in suppressing our nature. And there are many, many people who have discovered that in their life, of course. Yep. Okay. So the converse thing that pseudo-spirituality might do, uh, rather than looking for reasons to suppress yep. or ways to suppress, it looks for reasons and beliefs to help us openly live in our sexual addiction. Right. So, so, so yeah. this time, instead of rejecting completely a life of sexual... and have a life of sexual suppression, we openly accept and practice sexual promiscuity. And ironically, this can be driven by exactly the same emotion, can't it? Yeah, by nice. the emotion of shame exactly it's the same emotion just supp just suppressed and 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 controlled in a different way yeah mm. yeah so for example if we have some sexual shame we may want to actually overcome the shame by making out that we no longer have it in other words what we do is we get in enraged about having shame and then in our rage we then carry out actions that cause us to make out that we're not affected by our shame. So, so we, we start convincing ourselves that promiscuity is, is fine by us, like it doesn't have any effect on us and all those kind of things. We start <coughs> convincing ourselves. Then we'll be attracted to forms of spirituality that allow us to accept and openly practice some sexual promiscuity. So we'll be very attracted to things like tantric, uh, tantric sex practices, for example. And this idea of connecting to God dur through during sex, yeah. through sex, through yeah. I keep reminding yeah. people that you cannot connect to God through sex. You connect to God through a relationship with God. You connect to your partner through sex. <laughs> Does that make sense? God doesn't want to have sex with you. God wants to have another relationship. God already has sex herself with herself, <laughs> and uh, with with the other. You know, she is one complete soul. She doesn't need you to have sex with, right? Mm. The reality is the soulmate relationship is the sexual relationship, the relationship between the two halves of the soul. So, so whenever we're involved in openly accepting and practising sexual promiscuity and then we choose a form of religion or a form of spiritual development that supports that behaviour, then we're actually choosing it out of a, an addiction that we're responding to in one way or the other. So can you see how that affects our lives as well, like there are many forms of spirituality on the planet that are about the complete denial of sexual experience, which has no logical sense whatsoever to it. 
considering that we were built with sexual organs. And then there are also uh, complete forms of spirituality, less popular on the planet, but complete forms of spirituality that embrace the sexual experience with anybody and anything almost. And they, of course, also have issues with a very similar group of emotions. So that's something we need to consider. Yeah, it's very sad, isn't it? Because when we do confront or the injuries we have in our sexual selves, th that sexual part of our nature, and we heal them, what I'm beginning to feel is that there's so much creativity locked up in, in our sexual that sexual part of ourselves. Mm. Obviously, God created it to be a creative um, union, yeah. but also it feels like whole parts of my nature that are creative are kind of squashed through me judging and being ashamed and trying to avoid this yes. sexual side of myself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And if you think even uh, from a historical perspective, many religions have condemned female sexuality in particular mm -hmm. because they are so afraid of females having power over males. Yeah. And so what they do is establish another alternative and that is males having power over females. And so you see all the way through uh, the Bible, particularly in, the sec in, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see males exercising <coughs> power over females because females are being viewed as the weaker sex or... Or, or as being um, influential upon a male sexuality and therefore controlling a male sexuality. Uh, I remember, I think it is actually Luther that said um, he, he, he wasn't in favour of women being present in masses because they caused unholy erections in holy men. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a man... Not taking responsibility for his erection, is it not? <laughs> yeah. And uh, even in the Islamic faith, I know that I had friends who told me we need to cover ourselves because, uh, you know, otherwise we're responsible for what the man would do. It was the woman's responsibility to control the man's sexual desire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which probably leads to one of the final points, and that was about when. I'm just going to read it because it's quite long. When we're looking for sexual power or glory or we are afraid of sexual power, we either wish to be dominated sexually or to dominate sexually, mm -hmm. and we create pseudo-spiritual practices or belief systems to support our sexual injury. For example, becoming a sexual healer in order to have uh, sex with large numbers of men and women, mm -hmm. being attracted to Eastern philosophies that promote sexual power, using spirituality to promote promiscuity, using spirituality to promote serial monogamy, mm -hmm. allowing spirits to set up sexual liaisons and, being, and to be involved during the sex act, calling it sacred sexuality or sacred union, mm -hmm. but without involving development in love or a real connection to God. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so I suppose this brings us to an introduction to tomorrow, yeah. it, just as a conclusion to today's talk, and that is... Well, we've gone through you know, quite a few hours of what pseudo-spirituality is. What is real spirituality? What is true spirituality? And perhaps if we can go back to our original definition of true spirituality. And, and, and if you could just have a think about that tonight, if you want to come along tomorrow. What would be your definition of true spirituality? If everything we've talked about today was pseudo-spirituality... What makes up true spirituality? What, what are the underlying principles? And we won't discuss it now. It's just, it's just an idea for you to, to think about overnight if you're going to come tomorrow. What, are, what is real spirituality? What is true spirituality in contrast to what we've actually talked about today? I feel if we, if we, the reason why we're raising these issues with you is if, if we're able to determine the difference between pseudo-spirituality and true spirituality in our day-to-day -day life, then what it allows us to do... I'll just rub that off. So if, we, if we're allowed to do this and put in true spirituality... If we're able to determine the attributes and qualities of pseudo-spirituality... And if we're able to determine the attributes and qualities of true spirituality, can you see that in your day-to-day -day life, whatever is happening, you'll be able to see what event relates to which type of spirituality quite easily. 
And therefore, you'll be able to see what stuff you would like to investigate more fully or what stuff you can quite easily leave alone um, without having to investigate at all if you, want, if you don't want to. If we can see quite clearly that something is pseudo-spiritual, pseudo if something is not is fake spiritual, then what's the point of investigating it if we're trying to become more loving, truthful, honest, caring human beings? There's not much point in investigating that form of spirituality. Um, I don't agree with condemning other people for following that form of spirituality, but I do feel that we need to have our logic and emotions in check when we're examining the truth about different things. And so once we understand the underlying characteristics and nature of each form of spirituality, we can compare a lot of things that happen in our life and work out what's what quite easily without having to go down the track of spending years embracing it and then realising that something's not right here. In other words, years embracing a process that ends up in stagnation. We, we don't need to do that. We can embrace a process and we can just measure it against the principles or the characteristics of either type of spirituality and say, well, this is obviously pseudo-spiritual because this is the kind of thing that happens with pseudo-spirituality. This is obviously true spirituality. And, it, and it, if we have a third box, which is, I don't know, <laughs> which one it falls under, <laughs> right? Obviously, anything that we come up against will fall into one of those three boxes. <laughs> now, my suggestion is, if it comes under obviously under the first box or the first heading, then what's the point of spending much time on it? Like acknowledges existence, work out why it's there if you wish, but there's no need to spend a huge amount of time developing yourself in that form of spirituality. If it's obviously in the second box, then why not engage it? It's going to benefit your life, you're going to become more loving, you're going to become more truthful, it's going to help your life, why not engage it? And if it's in the third box, then investigate it at least. Don't just write it off, but investigate it. Right? Allow yourself to be open enough to make a mistake <laughs> as well. Does that make sense? And if you can do that with your, with your life with regard to these forms of spirituality, you will find very rapidly that you'll be able to determine the truth of different things. And in the end, isn't that what we want, most of us? Most of us do want to know the truth. We want to know what is the truth of the universe, what is the truth of things. And the fastest way to find it out is to know the characteristics of truth versus the characteristics of error. And that's the whole reason why we've done the discussion that we've done today. Okay. Um, is it possible that um, because of the, I think there was 11 points, there were so many emotional reasons that we were pulled to the spiritual path, that if we haven't released some emotional shift that we'll still be in pseudo-spirituality approaching it? Masking it as true spirituality, like the awareness is one thing to there, but we do have to release the emotions that drove us to pseudo spirituality because they're still in our soul. Exactly. And otherwise, we'll be tempted to engage with a true spiritual practice in a pseudo spiritual way. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, we'll be tempted to go, oh yes, I know that I need to be more loving. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to be more loving. Now, love comes from your heart. You can't try to be more loving. You either are more loving or you aren't more loving. Like one, now, if you're not, there's something in your heart that's forcing you to not be. You need to remove it from yourself before you will be. And this is where we need to start understanding our soul better. Our soul guides well, are what psychologists often call the unconscious mind. I would actually classify as the soul. Often it's our soul that guides our actions and behaviour without us even being aware intellectually of what we're doing we feel drawn to do certain things without knowing why and without understanding why and we do them over and over again without even contemplating oftentimes what we need to do instead is we need to become actually more loving because if we become actually more loving then the people around us have a chance to become act more loving actually if they haven't got a model then how can anybody become more loving it's very very difficult so, so my suggestion is learn, be a model of what it's like to become more loving, but become more loving 
in a manner that's not driven by your mind but actually comes from your heart, comes from your feelings, then you'll, then you'll be in a place where you're practicing true spirituality no matter what you hear. Whether you hear error or truth doesn't really matter anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and also when we start getting clear logically what is true and what is pseudo and we act ethically with our clarity of logical truth, it can also break... Um, codependent relationships and addiction with spirits enabling the causal emotions easier access yes very much so yeah, like so for example if i decide inside of myself that i'm not going to engage ethically in giving in codependent relationships anymore and i'm going to notice when i've got an addiction that i want met by the other person and instead of trying to get the addiction met i'm going to try to feel why i want the addiction met instead then i have a higher likelihood of being truthfully spiritual if, if I do the opposite, if I engage the addiction, no matter what form of spirituality I say I'm practicing, I'm probably going to be quite pseudo-spiritual, quite fake in my spirituality because my heart is not involved, my addictions are instead. And that's, that's what is the underlying reason why we have pseudo-spiritual practices on the planet because we want our addictions met. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got a two-part question. The, the first is out of curiosity whether you see um, good spirits or bad spirits in this room today. Um, and then the second part of the question is, is if, if God um, is the creator of everything and is so, and, and more loving than the most loving person on the planet, why do, the, why do those evil spirits even exist? Like, why not just go? Yep, good questions, both of them. First, firstly, yes, there are both spirits, forms of spirits here present today. There are spirits who have a positive, benevolent influence upon all of the members of the audience. And also there are a group of spirits here that are benevolent who are trying to help the other spirits as well. So they, they are whole very large groups of spirits trying to do that. There are a second group of spirits, which are the more malevolent spirits. At today, though, it's very interesting because many of them have been malevolent but are, are listening to this discussion with an openness that they haven't had before. We, we've had many groups where we have uh, malevolent spirits come and they, instead of listening, they are very attacking and they try, they try to disrupt the conversation. We haven't had many of those spirits here today, which is a great sign in the sense that it means many of them are wanting to learn rather than to attack. Right? In terms of why it happens, it's quite simple. Um, and if I can just explain why... It happens. And the same question applies to why there are good people on earth and why some people don't seem to be very good. It's exactly the same question with exactly the same answer. We all have the gift of will. We can use it in a loving direction which will result in happy emotions. We can use it in an unloving direction which will result in painful emotions. Every single person in the spirit world who is in an unhappy place or, a, or an angry place or what we would call a malevolent place wants to attack, every single person on earth who is in the same place have at some stage in their past life up to the present used their will in an unloving direction which is causing them to feel a great deal of internal pain. Every person who's a much more happier person in terms of a, a loving person, happier person in the spirit world in particular, has used their will in a loving direction and therefore it results in a happier place. It's, it's quite that simple. As are all truths. All truths are very, very simple. So what, what I get from that myself is if I use my will, the gift that God's given me, this, this beautiful gift actually that causes me to be a free sentient being able to make choices and if I use this will in a positive direction, the result for me and anybody around me is always going to be more happier than it would have previously been. And because I'm a work in progress, it can be a slowly increasing ramp of happiness. Does that make sense? If I use my will in a direction that is unloving in its, in its underlying premise, in other words, I want to control, manipulate, demand, 
I want to push people around, get what I want, be selfish, all of those kind of unloving desires and emotions. In the end, sooner or later, I will arrive in a painful place which will have a lot of painful emotions associated with it. Some of them will be anger, some of it will be grief, some of it will be terror and fear. And it's all because of my choices that I've personally made. If I understand the power of my own will to create either a happy life or a painful life, then I will be a lot more circumspect about the decisions that I make in my life. And that is the secret, I feel, to part of true spirituality. True spirituality tells you the truth about what happens with your life in a very simple, direct manner. If I choose loving actions, if I choose loving feelings, and if I choose to, to release from myself any unloving ones, I will, as a result, have happier life. And the people around me will have a happier life as a result. If I choose the opposite, then the opposite result is definitely going to come. In the first century, I called that you reap what you sow. That's what I called it. And AJ, just for the benefit of those spirits that are here, mm -hmm. who have obviously used their will in an unloving way. In um, the past. In yep. the past. Yep. What's keeping them here and in, in this sense of denial or wanting to be attached to people is their avoidance of that truth, isn't it? So they actually have the opportunity now to use their will in a more loving way and yeah. confront that pain. But it's not just their avoidance of that truth. So that, let's say they have chosen this direction in the past. Yeah. It's not just the avoidance of the truth. It's the avoidance of the painful emotions that result from that truth. Yes. So, so, so for the majority of us, what we do is we do some things in our lives that we're not that happy about and we don't feel that good about, but we try to turn off our mind from thinking about them. We don't actually, what I would classify as, repent from them or change from them. We don't, we don't actually feel a change in us where we feel sorry that we've done those particular things enough to change our life. For all of the spirits who are in a painful location, and any person on earth is in a painful location too, what we need to do is allow ourselves to feel our emotions about our painful situation without acting upon our emotions in the painful situation. So in other words, if I feel anger, I feel the anger, but I don't project that anger onto others. If I feel fear, then I feel my own fear without trying to get other people to share my fear. And if I have grief, I cry rather than wanting everybody else to cry with me. I cry because of my own feelings. If I do that, I can get through every unloving, painful event I've ever created and I can actually become a loving, happy individual. You can transform your life through that process. That's all we need to do. So we can choose at any moment in time to use our will to, ch to change our direction in our life and... and that's the beautiful gift that God's also given us, this ability to change the direction of our life at any point in our life. If a person's in an unloving, painful condition, they just need to understand that their will has been exercised up to now in a painful direction, out of harmony with love. So all they need to do is choose something different. Choose a different process. Choose a different path. You will reap what you sow, though. You, you can't choose... Like if you were thinking you were a farmer and you planted wheat, you wouldn't be sitting there waiting for the corn to grow. Would you? Because the wheat is what's going to come. If you point your will in an unloving direction, you can't then expect to have a heap of loving things happen to your life. Right? Because that, that's just not going to happen the way God's created the universe. It will be unloving things that happen to our life. Mm. Now, it has to change. The thing, thing is, it can't change here. It has to change here. Remember, pseudo-spirituality causes us to think we can change here without changing here. Right? True spirituality will cause us to believe that we have to change the heart. We have to change our motivations. We have to change our feelings and our emotions before we're actually going to change anything. Everything we attract is based around what's in our heart, not what's in our head. Right? So we need to understand that. And it's what's in our heart that needs to change. So we need to change what we sow, beginning with our heart. Our own heart has to change. 
Once we do that, then we will find ourselves having a more happy life. But it will be a progressive place. It can't be instantaneous because we have done things in the past often that are out of harmony with love. So it, it's going to have to, we're going to have to work our way through those and slowly progress to the place where we're more loving and, and happier as a result. And even though it might seem difficult to understand that now there's these negative influences around us here on earth and, and where's the justice in that, it's actually a, actually a provision of God's love that he's allowing, even after we pass, the opportunity to change and grow and, and hasn't reduced our will in any way, although there are some restrictions, more restrictions he places on us once we pass in terms of where we can go. But and there are more restrictions that we've placed on ourselves, to be honest. Yes, it's more um, relating to the choices we've used we've with our will while mm. we're on earth. Mm. But it is actually just that we're still given, we're still granted that opportunity to use our will in harmony with love or in disharmony with love. Yeah. So what we'd like to recommend today, today is to just have a think about the chat that we've had today. And tomorrow, if you could think about uh, what you believe true spirituality would be, the signs of true spirituality. What, what are the characteristics and attributes that you would expect if you were thinking that something would be true? And have a think about that. And if we can engage that in the discussion tomorrow, for those of you who come, that would be wonderful. Thanks for your time today, yes, guys. And um, we have to be out of here, what is it, at three again? Three. So, so, um, and we have to leave fairly suddenly because uh, they close up at quarter past three and set the alarms on. So, <laughs> so we can need to move. Yeah. Tomorrow uh, we tomorrow start at one. One, one o'clock. I'm pretty sure it's one. Yeah, yep. one. And if we go through to... Uh, 3.30. 3 30, I think we'll make it because we, we have to be out by 4, I think it is, isn't it? Or 4? Quarter past 4. Quarter past four. Oh, it's yeah, and we've got to pack up in that time too. Yeah, so, so. so yeah, yeah, half so, three. It probably so we'll have to finish about half three or even a bit earlier tomorrow. Could, I, could we just thank some people? Um, David and Yvette have um, done a lot of organising to have our venue and actually donated our venue. So thank you guys thank you so much. Thank you to those. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And also to our support crew, uh, Lena and Igor and um, Joy, Cavill and Diana. Have, yeah. uh, Who come and help us for that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And we'd like to thank you guys for your time today and we look forward to catching those of you who want to come tomorrow, here tomorrow again. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So good night. <laughs> Thanks.